Good morning, everyone. Welcome at day two. Rita, that's the developer's day. We're going to start. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Today we're going to start with front end coding. Our very first speaker here works for Microsoft, and he's going to show us all about HTML5 on Windows 8. Hi, Megan. Thank you very much. Hi. Give me a mic. Yes. Tell me about this. So they asked me. I had to make sure that all of you guys uh, are alright. So. Are you guys alright? That was very convincing. Let me try that one more time, please. Are you guys alright? That was better. Great. So, uh, let's talk about H5. I don't have a lot of time, so let's not fuck around. And I said fuck, by the way, no foul language in this talk. Um, we're going to talk about H5, and I'm really, really excited to be here today talking about this, because I think H5. If you, if you haven't checked it out, check it out. Go check it out. It's it's really cool, and it is a web application that behaves just like you would expect from a desktop application. It has all the same behaviors. It has drag and drop. It allows you to edit HTML or rich text emails inside of the browser. So it is a very rich experience, and it's all done in HTML5. This here is also an HTML5 website. Um, if you want to check this out, it's called cutterope.ie, the domain name. Um, and what this is, is, it's an HTML5 implementation of the game Cut the Rope, which you've seen. So this, again, is done using HTML5 features such as Canvas and other browser, whether it's on a smartphone, a tablet, or a laptop. The experience is always the same, and it's always a very rich, very cool experience. Now, all of this is made possible not just by HTML, which, which is really just the markup to, uh, to define the structure of your document, but by other technologies as well. And usually, when people refer to HTML5, what they're actually referring to is a combination of HTML5, CSS3, and ECMAScript5. Now, these three technologies are very, very powerful. But what really sort of closes the deal for writing applications using HTML5 is a very rich set of APIs. And these are some of the APIs that are supported by most modern browsers. And I'm not going to go through the entire list. But let me just say there's some really cool stuff in there, stuff that allows you to write files to the hard drive of the user, stuff that allows your websites to run offline even when the user isn't connected to the internet. You have stuff like, like, like WebSockets, which allow you to do asynchronous co communication, um, and just so much more. So HTML5 has become really powerful. And all of these APIs have been added to make HTML5 a great platform for writing applications. Um, now, what has any of this to do with Windows 8? Well, Windows 8, uh, some of you might have seen it. This is what it looks like. It is a very new and very reimagined operating system. You know that it looks different. You see the start screen here. That's what the start screen looks like. But it has been reimagined basically from the ground up. Uh, by the way, if this sounds too markety for you, I'll go switch to the code in a minute. I'm just going to set, set everything up so, uh, so you know what I'm talking about. 
what we've done with Windows 8 and what we're planning to do with Windows 8 is to create an operating system that not only works on one type of hardware, which in the past would have been a laptop or a desktop PC. We want to build an operating system that walked, works across device types. What you see here is a very standard gaming PC, a desktop PC, which you will probably use with a mouse and keyboard. You have a laptop computer, uh, an Ultrabook on the right, and then in the center you have the Microsoft Surface tablet, which is an ARM-based tablet in this case. So it runs on a different architecture, CPU architecture, than previous versions of Windows. But what's cool about this device is that it has a cover that also serves as a keyboard. So this device is sort of a hybrid between a tablet and a laptop computer. It's very light, it has long battery life, but it's at the same time, you can use it with a mouse and keyboard. So the type of usage scenarios we want to support are the ones where you switch from one usage scenario to, to another. If you're at home working with Visual Studio or Photoshop or whatever, you, of course you want to have the full experience with the keyboard and mouse. But when you're on the road, you probably want a touch device or you want to have a stylus on your device. And Windows 8 will support all of these different types of usage scenarios. To be able to support all, all of that, we had to go very deep and change a lot of things. And, um, oh, I, for, I forgot that one. This is an 82-inch 80, touchscreen monitor, and Windows 8 runs fine on this as well. This is high resolution. I don't know what resolution this has, but it's pretty big. Um, again, you can run Windows 8 on those type of devices as well. Now, to make all of this possible, we had to make quite a lot of significant changes to Windows 8. The one you've seen and you've probably experienced yourself is the, the um, Windows user experience. So we changed the UI. But the changes actually go far more deeply than that. We have a new Windows runtime. Uh, that's the Windows API. And if you've written any code for Windows in the past, you know that there's something like .NET or something like Win32. Um, we have a new API called WinRT, and I'm going to show you some of that in a minute. We also have a new execution environment, um, so apps run in a different kind of way. I'm going to go into that in a bit as well. And we have the Windows Store, which is a singular platform for developers to publish their apps and to get people to be able to download them uh, very easily. Now, this is a little architectural chart of what Windows 8 looks like in, on the inside. And uh, just to make sure this is absolutely clear, because I get, get the, this as a question quite, quite often, uh, there is still a desktop. And all the applications that run on Windows 7 will also run on Windows 8. So no worries there. That'll just work. There's still Win32, so all your games, all your uh, existing applications will run. There's still .NET. You can still run your .NET applications. There's Silverlight and all of that stuff. So um, you lose none of that, but you gain a quite, quite a significant uh, new platform, which is the Windows 8 uh, Store App Platform, or WinRT. And WinRT is interesting and significant because it's a newly designed Windows API um, that supports, that has a sort of a unified interface for three different types of programming languages. We do have support for native code, so C and C++. If you're a game developer, that's probably going to be interesting to you. Uh, we do have support for C Sharp and Visual Basic, and we have support for HTML5 and JavaScript. And this last part is probably the most significant change, because JavaScript is now a first-class citizen, a first-class language in the Windows 8 ecosystem. So you can write native applications for Windows 8 uh, in JavaScript. And let me say that again. You can write native applications. So this is not PhoneGap. This is not some kind of framework. This is actually built into the operating system. And these applications feel and behave as if they were native applications, which, in fact, they are. To make all of that possible, to allow you to write native applications using just HTML5, we had to really uh, improve the HTML5 support on our platform. You know that we've done some work there with Internet Explorer 9, but with Internet Explorer 10, which also powers the Windows 8 applications built on HTML5, we made quite a, a lot of different improvements. And these are just a few, but let me, let me say the support for HTML5 is rather significant. You have all the CSS3 goodness. You have all the great APIs. Basically, what we've done is we've taken everything that is already a standard, implemented that, 
and we've taken sort of a selection of working drafts that are rather far in their development and implemented those as well. And you're going to see some of that in a minute. But really, that was very marketing, and you really, really shouldn't take that from me. Uh, don't take it from me. Take it from, uh, let's see. Take it from Rainbow Cat. So this is an HM5 application that I wrote. And let's just see if the, the audio is working. OK. So Rainbow CAD is an HTML5 application. And Rainbow CAD uh, can tell you interesting things. So Rainbow CAD, tell us what's great about uh, HTML5 on Windows 8. This is going to take a while, because Rainbow CAD has to think. Did you hear that? She said, well, I like rainbows. Rainbow CAD, well, that's not very helpful, Rainbow CAD. Um, what else do you have to say? I'm very sorry about that. Usually, Rainbow Cat is a very nice cat. Today, I think she has a bad day. Uh, Rainbow Cat, I think you should apologize to, you, to our audience, because that's not appropriate language to use in this kind of setting. Oh my god. I, I'm really sorry about that. Let, let's, let's turn that off. Uh, I didn't know she was in such a bad mood. So let's look at how this works. This is, in fact, an HTML5 application running on the Windows runtime. And this is sort of the basic, um, uh, the basic HTML page that powers this application. Now, if you look at that, and if you have any experience with HTML5, you're going to see that nothing in here is in any way Windows specific. All of this is just standards compliant HTML5 code. You have the semantic tags. You have a little bit of JavaScript and uh, CSS. But there's nothing in here that would make you think that this is a Windows 8 application. In fact, you could take all of this, just copy it into a, a, an HTML file, run it in the browser, and it would just work. Now let's have a look at the CSS file that powers this application. Again, nothing special here. Uh, the nice little rainbow in the back is actually a CSS3 animation. Um, this is a feature. This is actually my favorite uh, CSS3 feature, repeating radial gradients. If you put that in your application, they're going to look awesome like this one. Um, by the way, when I, whenever I show this demo, I always make sure that Tim Berners-Lee is in the, in the audience, because I fear that that's not what he had in mind when he came up with the World Wide Web. But still, pretty cool that uh, HTML has evolved to be able to do something like this. So again, nothing special here. In case you're wondering, this MS prefix, you've probably seen a WebKit or a Mods prefix in other applications. This is basically called a vendor prefix, and that is done to denote that a, that a standard is not complete yet. So uh, the radial gradient API is not finished yet. It's still a working draft. And to make sure that if this API ever changes, which it, which it still can, um, so that we can make adjustments here, there's this prefix. This means you can still use it. It's going to work just fine. But uh, be aware that this is not a finished uh, W3C standard. Um, so a lot of this code, uh, you're probably going to be familiar with. All of this is standards compliant CSS3. And you can could, again, just take this, copy it into a website, and it would just work. Now let's look at the JavaScript for a second. Uh, here's the lines that the, the cat can say. And again, this is all very normal, very standard JavaScript. You see this use strict declaration. This is ECMAScript 5 strict mode. So uh, again, it will tell you when you're messing up your code and using notations that aren't cool. And basically what it does it is it waits for the page to, ha to be ready. And it, it uses the query selector API to retrieve a reference to the button. And then it adds an event listener. Again, nothing special. And then it uh, does something a little bit unusual. I'm going to get into what that is in a second. It uses more selectors to create the talking animation. The talking animation is also a CSS3 animation. Then it creates an HTML5 audio element. And this is, again, special. I'm going to get into that in a second. But what it does is it takes the audio, which, is, which com comes back from the text-to-speech API that I use, and turns that into a blob. A blob is a data structure in HTML5, so you can just use that. And there's actually an HTML5 API, which is, again, uh, just HTML5 standard stuff. Uh, to turn a blob into a URL. I can take that URL, then stick it into the, the audio element, and I use an event listener to stop the talk animation the moment the audio has played. So 
there's two lines in there that aren't standard JavaScript. Everything else is just standard JavaScript. Um, now, what is this speech engine get speech stream? This is actually a library that I'm using. And this library uses the Bing Translate API to turn text into speech. Now, the, thing, the interesting thing about this is that this library already existed, and it's actually written in C Sharp. So what this application does is it's written in JavaScript, and it uses a C Sharp library, and it just communicates with it. And I didn't have to change anything to make that work. Um, you can see why this works, because uh, because of the common platform WinRT, which is shared among all languages, you can just call C and C++ as well as C Sharp from JavaScript with no, no effort at all. So um, this is pretty cool. Again, standard JavaScript with a little magic from C Sharp. So very powerful platform. And what I'd like to point out is that, in fact, you can use all your JavaScript libraries that you're using today also on Windows 8, BJ, Query, Dojo, or whatever you're using. All of that will still work on Windows 8. So, um, so much for that. Let's, I, I figured we should probably write a useful application as well. So I'm going to go and create a new project and show you how to write interesting applications in Windows 8. I'm going to create an, a blank application. There's actually some very cool templates in, in Visual Studio. But let's start with a blank template. Um, and what I want to write is a very simple Twitter client. So let's do that. What I'd like to do first is I'd like to create uh, a JavaScript file that contains just my data. So I'm going to say this is actually data.js. And I'm going to just write a little bit of boilerplate code here. So you all, if you've written any JavaScript, you probably are familiar with this notation. This is just to make sure that whatever I write in there doesn't pollute the global namespace. I'm gonna, also going to do the use strict stuff, because I don't want uh, errors to disappear. And then I'm going to create an array uh, of tweets. Now, I'm not just going to create an array. I'm going to create uh, a special list, which is part of WinJS. And WinJS is a JavaScript library that's part of Windows 8 uh, that you can use if you like. So I'm going to say WinJS. And as you can see, I don't get any IntelliSense here. The reason I don't get any IntelliSense here is that the JavaScript file, I have not yet integrated this into my HTML page. So let's do that real quick. Uh, Data.js. And if I'm lucky, uh, I should get IntelliSense now. This is some of the great tool support in Visual Studio for HTML5. So you get really good auto completion on JavaScript, uh, on CSS3, and on, on HTML5. And what I can do now is I can create a JavaScript binding list. And this is actually just a, a kind of collection that supports data binding. What that is, I'm going to show you in a second. I'm going to fill this with some dummy data. So I'm going to say author is Kai Jaeger. And the text is hello world. And maybe I also want an image. So let's say image URL. And that's going to be blank. And through the magic of copy and paste, let's create a bunch, of, bunch more of these. And now I need a way to make this data structure, which I've defined inside of the file, visible to the outside. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use another function in WinJS. Uh, called winjs.namespace.define. Uh, you probably know that JavaScript doesn't natively support namespaces. This is an API that kind of fixes that. Uh, again, it's all standard JavaScript stuff. I can actually right-click on this, say, go to definition, and I can look at the implementation of this library. So the library is all JavaScript, and it's, uh, the source code is basically included. And you can just step through it and see what's going on there. So in here, I'm going to define a namespace called data. And I want to have um, a bunch of fields. And let's define this as tweets. So so much for my data model. Uh, now I want to make this application look interesting. So let's go to the HTML page. And as you can see, because this is the blank template, there's actually nothing in there. I could start by, you know, let's, uh, I could just start typing here, and I'd get all of this IntelliSense support. But there's actually a better way of creating HTML uh, UI in Windows 8. What I can do is right click on my project and say, open in blend. Now, if you have written any, any uh, Silverlight code or any WPF code, you know blend, which is a UI designer for uh, XAML. 
Now for Windows 8, we've updated uh, Blend to also support HTML5. And probably if you've uh, designed web pages using a what you see is what you get editor in the past, you probably hated it because it generated all of this code that you didn't want it to generate. It, it will generate inline CSS. It will generate tables and all of that stuff that you really don't want. So when we developed Blend, we actually decided we wanted to want to get it right this time. We want to uh, build an editor that does exactly what you want. So this doesn't allow you to just drag elements in there and move them, and it, and it will position them uh, using position absolute or whatever. This is actually the, the way I like to think about it. It's actually you, you know all of these developer tools in browsers these days, like uh, Firebug. This is actually Firebug, except it generates code for you once uh, as you mess with the elements. So this is actually really cool. Um, I hope you can see this, but let's get started. Um, let's just go to the code. I'm going to get rid of that. So let's create a basic layout. Now, um, a basic layout is usually sort of a grid. And the, the problem with grids and HTML is that grids are not really supported or weren't until very recently. What we do, did is we support a CSS3 uh, feature called uh, grid layouts. And this allows you to create table type layouts without writing any markup. I'm going to show you how this works in a second. So I'm going to go into my CSS here. And there's a tag for body, so this is good. So let's select uh, the body, make sure I'm in the right file. And I can just take, uh, change the layout type uh, to display MS grid. The, again, the prefix MS, because this is not a finished standard, but is, it is a W3C specification. What I can then do is I can just uh, specify rows and columns. So I've specified uh, a row here and a column here. And I can say, you know, I want this to be 120 pixels. And this should be, uh, let's make this 100 pixels. There you go. Now, if I look into the source code, uh, of this, this HTML page, what you can see is that it hasn't actually created any markup, and it hasn't actually modified any inline CSS. Everything I did ended up in the CSS file that's associated with the page. So this is exactly what you would write if you were to write this by hand. And this is sort of the, the, the goal we had in mind with this tool, that it never generates anything that you don't want it to generate. Um, now let's create. Um, a headline. A headline is, of course, an H1 tag. So let's drag this in here. And uh, let's save this. So here's the headline. Uh, I'm going to say Twitter. I would say Twitter. Now what happened there, if I go into the markup now, is it actually defined the grid column in line. Now this is ugly. We don't want that. The reason why I did that is because I just dragged this in there and then didn't know where to put the uh, CSS. So let's fix this. I'm going to go into my style sheet, uh, define a new rule for h1. And as you can see, as I create the rule, all the elements that the selector applies to are highlighted using a frame. So this makes it very easy to know what you're modifying and what you aren't. So as I select the h1, what you can see is all the styles that apply to this. If I go to inline style and say view set properties only, you can see that the only style that's defined inline is the grid column. So what I can do is I can actually right click on the style, say cut, select the, the proper rule, and say paste. And what it does is it takes the inline style and copies it into the style sheet. So if you ever have any inline style that you don't want to be an inline style, that's how you fix it. Now the next thing I need for my Twitter client is a list to visualize the data in. And as you know, there's not a list control in HTML5. So what we did is, with WinJS, we created a library of controls, of controls that look like the Windows UI should look. And these are all written in JavaScript. So none of that is Windows 8 specific. This is actually all JavaScript code. So let me take the list view control and drag it in here. And as I go into what you see down there is the live DOM view. So this is the live view of your document object model. And as I expand this, you can see that this list view is actually made up of div elements. So this is all uh, HTML code, nothing special about this. So let me, let me style this list a little bit. Um, I'm going to create a new rule and say I want a div that's directly inside of the body. And what I want there is um, I want the height to be set. So let's remove the setting and go for the height. So height. 
I want the height to be 100%. There's another rule that overrides this, so I have to add a little bit more power to that. And here's my list. Now, the next thing I do need to do is I somehow have to get my data into this list. And the way we do this uh, is through what's called data binding. Actually, let's, let's first look at the HTML code, HTML code real quick. Again, you see there's some inline CSS. I could fix this. You've, you've seen how to do it, so I'm going to do this right now. But the list view control that I just added is actually a div with a data annotation. And these data annotations are the standards compliant way to create custom tags. So in HTML, you can't just invent tags, but you can add data annotations to existing tags. And this is how the library knows this, this is actually a control and not a regular div. So going back to the design view, I can actually just go in there and say, um, make sure I've selected the, the list. There we go. Um, this th this uh, list has a, an attribute called item data source. And this allows me to specify where the data comes from. So I can just say data.tweets.data source. That's the file we defined earlier, the JavaScript file. And as I hit return, you can see that the data already shows up in my list. Now, this is pretty remarkable. And the reason why this is remarkable is because what Blend actually does is, in the background, it runs your application the whole time. So this is not a dead view of my HTML. This is actually running code that I'm interacting with. So again, this is very much like uh, the developer tools in your browser, like Firebug. You're working with the live document. There's actually an interactive mode that lets me interact with the application and sort of take a freeze frame and then apply CSS rules to that. So this is a very, very cool thing. Now, the problem is I have all of these items now, but this is not how I want my data to be visualized. So let's create a template um, to, to be able to style the way this is uh, visualized. So let's create a new template. I'm going to call this Tweet Template. I'm going to hit OK. And already, this looks different. If I go into the, the, the HTML code real quick, you can see that it has created a div, uh, again, with a data annotation. So this is how you define templates uh, in WinJS. It's just a chunk of HTML code. Now, this again is, this is better, but it's still not what I want. So let's, let's fix this. Um, and what, you, what you'll notice is that as I click on these items, again, this is live data. This is generated by JavaScript code. And as I select these, you'll probably see that there's a frame up here that says that this content is defined in the template. So it actually knows that when I mess around with this, it should be messing around with the template. So, let me give um, this outer div a class name. I'm going to call this, um, uh, let's call this tweet item. And now I can just start creating new rules. So let's create a new rule for tweet item. And as I uh, type it, you can see that it selects all the divs that have the class name so I know what this applies to. If I select this now, uh, let's select one of these. If I select this now, and uh, just make sure I have the tweet item selected. I can actually drag this to the size that I want it to be. And if I look into the CSS, you can see that it has actually put the width and height attribute into the CSS file where it belongs. So this is what you see is what you get, except it doesn't mess with your code. It does exactly what you tell it to do. Um, I'm going to make this a little bit prettier. So let's say this is 100 pixels high. and. Um, I want this to be 360 pixels wide. Again, in terms of visualization, this is, again, not exactly what I want. Uh, so let's make a few changes. I'm going to say um, display. Uh, there we go. I'm also going to make this a grid again, because grids are cool. And then I also want an image. So let's find an image, drag this in here. Um, and. So there's a div inside of this. This should probably go into a separate column. So say grid column. Uh, this should be two. And inside of this, this actually has data binding on it. So let's take this off. I'm just going to do this real, real quick so we don't run over time. Um, I want two divs inside of this. So let's do this now. Div number one. And there we go. So this is the inner div. And 
Now this is where the magic of data binding comes in. So data, data binding allows me to take attributes from my data model and bind them to a UI without having to write code. So I'm going to data bind the text content uh, to the author attribute. And as I change this data binding, you can see because this is running code that the data appears instantly inside of my application. I can do this again. Let's create a new div down there. And I'm going to data bind this uh, to the text attribute. And instantly, my text shows up right here. I can also do this with the image. So let's data bind uh, the image to image URI. And because I didn't specify an image in my data model, uh, nothing shows up, which is OK. So, so much for my UI. Uh, as you saw, at no point did I have to touch HTML. But I could have at all times. I could have just written all of this by hand. So you have a choice. You can write it by hand, or you can use the tooling if you like. Now, I'm going back to, uh, let me sh make sure I save this. I'm going back to Visual Studio now. It asked me to reload. So Visual Studio and Blend use the same project format, so I can just switch back and forth between the tools uh, any, any way I want. So now what I want to do is take, all, take out all of this dummy data and replace it with real data. So let's remove this. And Twitter actually has a web service that I can call that returns an RSS feed uh, for a specific tag. And that's what I want to do. Now, you can write all of this using just standards compliant HTML. I could use XML HTTP requests to you know, make a request to the RSS feed and then add it into my data model. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to call into WinRT, the Windows API, because WinRT has support for RSS feeds built in. So let's create, uh, actually, let me zoom in. Uh, I'm going to create uh, a syndication client. And this is in the windows.web.syndication uh, syndication client namespace. So what I'm doing here is I'm actually calling into the operating system. This is a Windows API. This is no longer JavaScript. But because Windows natively supports JavaScript, it actually has a projection for the Windows API into JavaScript that looks the way it should look in JavaScript. So I can say syndication client dot retrieve feed async. And this expects a URI. So let's do uh, create a new URI, windows.foundation.uri. And the URI happens to be http search.twitter.com slash search.rss. And let's actually take the campus party tag. And because this is an asynchronous operation, and all, most uh, calls into the Windows API that take a while to complete are asynchronous, I actually have to specify a callback here. So let's create the callback. And what I get, get in return is the feed. So here's the callback. Now that I have the feed in hand, I can actually start adding the feed items into my tweet collection. So let's do the following. Uh, Feed.items.foreach. Uh, again, this is, this is now JavaScript syntax. So what happens is the Windows API calls are mapped onto JavaScript objects. So if the Windows API returns a collection, this is actually turned into a JavaScript uh, array. So you're working on familiar types. Uh, so let's get the item. And what I want to do is tweets.push. Um, and I'm going to create a new uh, inline object. I want the author. I can find the author in uh, here. Let's use the email address for the author. And then I want the text. And I can find the text inside of item uh, text. And now I need the image. So image URI. The problem with the image is that RSS does not have built-in support for images. So this is actually in a different namespace. So I have to find this using a little bit of JavaScript magic. So let's go in here and say element extensions. And let's use a little higher order function. So return item dot node name equals image link. I realize that this isn't very pretty, but this is actually the only way to retrieve it because it's again in a different namespace. And then I'm just going to pop this and use the node value. 
as you can see, until now, the auto completion has worked very well, and this is where it fails for the first time. So once you see all of these exclamation marks, it means that the auto completion doesn't know what to tell you here. JavaScript being dynamically typed is incredibly hard to um, implement uh, efficiently in tools like these because you don't have types at, compi at compile time. What Visual Studio actually does is it runs your JavaScript code in the background all the time to determine the types while you type, so you have pretty good autocomplete. In this specific case, it doesn't know what to do with it, so let's say node value. I know I have to type this, so here's my code. Let's uh, actually start this again and see what this does. Ta-da! So with very little effort and using the tools uh, quite intensively, I actually have created an application that shows me Twitter feeds. It's called into the Windows API, so I didn't have to write all this RSS magic myself, but it's still all HTML5. Uh, actually, if I tap back into this, I can go to debug, and um, let's see what we have here. Uh, I have the DOM Explorer, so I can actually step through my document object model while the application is running. I also have a JavaScript console, so I can actually run stuff in the JavaScript console like you could in a browser with something like Firebug. So the tool support is pretty significant. What you can also do is you can actually change uh, CSS rules on the fly while your application is running without having to restart it. So again, it uses the dynamic nature of JavaScript to make the development experience very, very smooth and very, very nice. Um, so let me step back into the slides real quick. <coughs> and recap what we just saw. And then I'm going to leave plenty of time for Q&A. So HTML5 is a first-class citizen in Windows 8. And what I mean by that is it's not second to C Sharp or C or C++. It's actually of the same standard, it's the same status in Windows 8. So you can actually use all of these languages. And you, in fact, you can mix them freely if you feel like it. The tool support is pretty, pretty darn good. So. I don't think there's anywhere, there's better HTML5 support uh, anywhere else. Um, the, the, the UI design tools are pretty cool, but also the JavaScript, just the, the editor that allows you to type the JavaScript and give you autocomplete is pretty, pretty good. And then kittens love rainbows, but you've seen that. But even more importantly, Windows 8 is a pretty good opportunity for developers to innovate on, pla on a platform that is very new and very powerful. So just imagine or just think about the fact that Windows right now is installed on over a billion PCs. Over a billion PCs out there are running Windows. Over 600 million of these are running Windows 7. So, so once you develop for Windows 8, you can basically be sure that there will be an audience for your application. And again, with the tool support, with the language support, you can actually take your existing HTML5 skills and apply them directly to developing Windows 8 applications. So now I'm going to take it over to Q&A. Uh, just one more thing. If you have any questions, if you'd like to learn more about what you've seen, we're over there in the Microsoft coding space. We're here all week, so you can join us for coding cams, all of that stuff. So come over there, ask us questions. And I'd love to hear some questions from you right now. Over there. Thanks. Uh, you said that the Visual Studio runs your code for code completion yeah. as you type it. Uh, how does it determine, for example, I'm using some library that does external calls to some, I don't know, web server. Yeah. Uh, how does it determine if it should do it then or not? Because, you know, spamming the web servers with calls while you're developing isn't really very good. Yeah, that's a very good point. So, the way Visual Studio does that, it's not actually running your code, it's doing something called abstract interpretation. This has been in existence for a while, it's a pretty cool technology in compilers. And the way it works is, it does, it executes all the code that it can execute, but once you call into a library, it just starts guessing. So if you call a web service, of course it's not going to call the web service. But it's going to figure out, well, it's most likely, by the way, you use your types, that this is going to return an object of a specific type. So you're not going to see it uh, fired away in your web services. Also, if you do something that requires user input, like if you, you know, have a dialog box, it's not going to open the dialog box while you're typing. So it's actually very clever about it. Any 
you're going to see it work in about 95% of all cases, and then if it's too specific, if there's no way for you to figure it out while you're typing, you're going to get these small exclamation marks and then basically you're on your own. But this doesn't happen very often. But uh, you have no, uh, like compiled languages like C sharp, yeah. you, you have no checker right there for JavaScript, like uh, because you have this technology that can actually go complete with JavaScript, yeah. uh, and you could do sometimes some like lint checking. Yeah. So it's possible, like, to know if the code that I type. Valid or it just fails at runtime as involved in a language. Yeah, so there's with uh, JavaScript based Windows 8 application, there's really no compile time. So once it runs, it's going to run the application immediately. So there's no lint phase in the compilation, so you're not getting any feedback until the application actually runs. But there's actually third party plugins for Visual Studio that do exactly that. There's one called VSLint, which does basically that. If you hit run, it's going to lint check your JavaScript code and give you error messages before the application runs. So we don't have support for that, but there's third party support for that. Right? There's one in the back. Hi. Hi. Um, really good.
There's a question over there. Okay. <laughs> Correct. Sorry. Uh, correct me at this if I'm wrong, but if I remember correctly, uh, you can override functions in JavaScript. You can, you know, just go to string prototype and say replace all is now 42. And what happens if a malicious application, for example, I install a Twitter client, actually goes to WinRT libraries and replaces prototype functions of them with something that acts correctly but is, let's say, sending your data to some malicious site? OK, so um, Windows applications, Windows 8 applications are actually sandboxed. So there's no way for a Windows 8 application to mess with operating res system resources. And every application gets their own copy, virtual copy of WinJS. So you can also, you could override string in your own application, it would, but it wouldn't have an effect on the other applications. So basically this is impossible by the way it's designed. More questions? There's one over there. Um, I love testing and how can I test my JavaScript code in my Windows 8 application? I think you're the only person ever to say I love testing. <laughs> but that's awesome. Well, um, of course there's uh, unit testing support built into Visual Studio, but you can also use your own JavaScript unit testing frameworks if you like. Um, there's really no limitation to what you can do. We have profiler support in there, so if you want to make sure that your application is fast, you can profile it using Visual Studio. You can write unit tests using Visual Studio. So there's plenty of support for that. Um, we have Team Foundation server integration, which, which lets you work in teams and do test stuff. So there's quite a lot of uh, opportunities there for you to write nice code. I guess we all know that JavaScript being dynamically typed and being a bit weird, uh, it's, it's hard to write beautiful code in it, and we, we try to make it as easy as possible. But of course, it still requires a bit of discipline, and so testing is a very important part of that. More questions over there. Right over there. Uh, just one short question. As you mentioned, the JavaScript, just <coughs> that JavaScript is a quirky language. Yeah. Uh, can you use CoffeeScript to write your apps? That, that's actually a very good question. If you can get your CoffeeScript to compile into JavaScript before it gets built into a Windows 8 application somehow, so just sort of as a pre-built pass, I think it would be possible. I haven't seen any, anyone do it yet, but I don't, don't really see why it wouldn't work, because CoffeeScript just compiles into JavaScript. But again, I think that's something that third parties would have to do. Visual Studio has a great extensibility model, so you can probably pull this off very easily. So I wouldn't be surprised to see this in a couple of months after launch. Any more questions? All right. So you're going to find us over there. Let me say that again. Oh, there's one more here. <clears throat> in uh, WinRT, yeah. uh, I can uh, use only uh, native languages. So. Yeah. If I have an application with an SSC, just uh, I can just uh, oh. if I have an application written in SSC, yeah. I can just uh, compile it and run it in WinRT. Uh, I didn't get the first part of the question. Could you maybe ask? If it? I have an application written, uh, for example, in SSC, uh -huh. I can just compile it and run it in WinRT. Well. Uh, there's uh, so first of all, uh, WinRT is is uh, its own API. So existing code and existing libraries will have to be compiled against this API. So if you have like native code applications, there's actually a subset of Win32 that is supported in Windows 8, but it's only a subset because, uh, of course, of, because of the sandboxing and so on. There's a lot of libraries that will work out of the box on Win Windows 8, such as Boost, uh, the C++ Boost library will work. Um, there's other libraries as well, but usually they would have to make some adjustments. Uh, just to be sure, everything that does file system access won't work out of the box because file system access is a bit different uh, because it is more secure. But generally, I would imagine that most, app most frameworks, let's say, for example, you have a mathematics framework written in C++, I would figure that that would 
just work because there's really no reason why it wouldn't, because it wouldn't be doing file system access. More questions. There's one right there in the back. Oh, I'm I'm losing my mic again. Um, what rendering engine does uh, Windows 8 use? I didn't get the first part of your question. What rendering engine? Ah, uh, so the Windows 8 rendering engine is. Uh, can you hear me still? Good. So Windows 8 is built on DirectX. So everything, every pixel you're going to see on your screen is actually hardware accelerated across all languages. So when it's uh, XAML, it's uh, of course DirectX. When it's HTML5, it's also DirectX accelerated. So if you have like a, an ARM tablet which has a GPU, which most of them have, your graphics are going to be really snappy. The rendering engine is the latest version of the Trident engine, which is the rendering engine in Internet Explorer 10. And um, so for Internet Explorer 9, we basically revamped it entirely from before. And then with Internet Explorer 10, we made some very significant improvements. So you're going to see really snappy performance graphics-wise um, with Canvas or SVG. All of that is hardware accelerated. We also improved the JavaScript engine. So the JavaScript engine has a background compiler that actually compiles your JavaScript code into machine code. And so your JavaScript code will run with near native performance. So again, performance should not be a problem even on low power devices like ARM tablets. There's one over there. <coughs> Let's have a look at the time. Yeah, six more minutes. Great. Uh, we've all, <coughs> we all know that Internet Explorer has shown, and Trident Engine has shown, a uh, particularly interesting uh, take on CSS rules. Uh, isn't it go? I mean, I'm a bit afraid that would, <coughs> will it not happen that we will have those dreaded if EA more than, I don't know, 10? use this CSS? What, right. what are you doing to, to you know, match these standards completely? Are you doing the acid tests on Trident? And yeah. So this is a very valid question. And let me say, uh, I'm very sorry about Internet Explorer 6. It wasn't my idea. Um, so with Internet Explorer 10, um, and actually with Internet Explorer 9, we've taken a very different stance on how we, am I still? OK. All right. OK, can you still hear me? Very good. Uh, so with Internet Explorer 10 or 9, we've actually switched to a different model. So in the past, when we implemented standards specifically around the IE6 timeframe, it really was more about competing with other browsers than about impl implementing the standard. So everybody was trying to be the first to implement a standard, even when the standard wasn't actually done yet. So with IE9, we said, Let's implement everything that's a recommendation, which is the W3C term for a standard that's actually finished. And if it's a working draft and it's interesting, let's make sure we only implement the features that are very solid. So HTML5, the, the main HTML5 standard, is actually still a working draft. And that means that it's actively being worked on. Now, this is dangerous to implement something like that, because if it changes and you have an implementation in your browser, then of course, everybody is going to have to change their code. If you think about the IE6, in IE6, I don't think I have, uh, oh, there we go. Um, in IE6, we tried to be among the first to implement CSS2. Now, CSS2 wasn't a, a proper specification back then. And what happened was that IE6 had a very large market share, and then the standard was, was changed. And by the time, of course, because we had such a large market share, we couldn't just fix it, because that would have broken basically 90% of the web. So with i9, we said, no, we're not having any of that anymore. So we said, we all, we're only implementing features that are, that are actually done. And in fact, I think we're doing a pretty good job of that, because uh, we didn't have to, the implementation of CSS3 and HTML5 that we have in IE, we didn't have to touch any of that after it was released, because it just stayed that way. With i10, we implemented a few more features. What's happening? Uh, so we implemented a few more features with i10. But again, we were very selective about what to implement, what was done, uh, and what wasn't. So you probably know that we didn't have support for WebSockets in Internet Explorer 9. 
and everybody else did, but then they had to take it back because of security issues that were in the standard, so they actually had to change the implementation. We didn't do that, and we were ridiculed because of it, but I don't think we'd made a wrong decision. I think it was actually a smart thing to do, because now that the standard is more evolved, we implemented it into IE 10, and it's actually working really well. So we're very careful. I don't think we're going to have the kind of issues we had with IE 6, with IE 10, or Windows 8 applications, because we actually have, it, we have a different approach. We write test cases first before we implement. We share these test cases with the W3C, and other browser vendors use our, uh, our test cases, or we share them with other browser vendors. So I think overall, if you look at how different browser manufacturers are working together in the W3C, I think we're all sort of working towards a common goal, which is to have a consistent experience across browsers. And I think this is, has worked really well, and it's going to work really well in the future. Any more questions? There's one. OK. So I was just told this is the last question, so make it count. Uh, what about it's, it's a name? I can use it in a winner team. Yeah. So the question is, what, what about XNA? So XNA is a very cool framework. I'm a big fan of XNA. Um, the problem is, with Windows 8, um, we, we were trying to 